Hi, welcome to your lecture on germ theory. On vision, I have attached this link to this PowerPoint. I would love for you to go to the Cells Alive website and actually look at the scale of everything. I will show you in class just how small things are in relation to each other um, and how large they get as well. These are a couple websites that you can click on the links to from the PowerPoint slide to see. <clears throat> Recall that the first microorganisms that were observed were by Anton van Leeuwenhoek that described live microorganisms that he observed in his teeth scrapings, rainwater, and peppercorn infusions, pond water. And this was the microscope that he made. The lens was the little small circle on there and he put his specimen on the tip of his pen. He could change the focus by adjusting the screws so you can either move it up or down or in or out. What was believed at the time was the theory called spontaneous generation. Spontaneous generation was the hypothesis that living organisms arose from non-living matter. And it was about 100 years ago that it was believed that toads, snakes, mice could be born of moist soil, flies from manure, maggots from decay, so that all of these living things came from non-living. Francisco Reddy did the experiment that is pictured here. And it was an experiment that disproved spontaneous generation. Reddy spelled R-E-D-I. And what he did was he took pieces of meat and he put them into uh, different containers. And some of the containers he left open to the elements and some he closed off. And the ones that were left open grew maggots and the ones that were closed off so flies could not get to them did not. So this experiment disproved spontaneous generation. The theory at the time thought that the flies and the maggots, they came from the rotting meat. But if the rotting meat was not exposed to the air so flies could not get to it, then there were no maggots. So it supported the fact that the maggots came from other flies. The flies came from other flies. They didn't actually develop or they weren't created by the rotting meat themselves. So that supported the theory of biogenesis. Biogenesis, bio, the word bio means life and the word genesis is the beginning. So it's how life begins. So the alternative hypothesis is that living organisms arise from pre-existing life. It's called biogenesis. So the flies come from other flies. Um, you know, fish come from other fish, mice come from other mice, life comes from life. And it seems uh, very common or obvious right now, but it hasn't always been obvious. So Louis Pasteur did an experiment with his S-shaped flask that um, kept microbes out, but let some air in. And it's still on display and shows no signs of contamination. He created the pasteurization process. This was actually wine in his flask that he put in there and he heated it to kill all the microbes that were inside the wine and let it sit out in the open, but no microbes could get through this S-shaped opening uh, into the wine to contaminate it. So it stayed free of contamination. We still use his pasteurization process now. We use it for milk, we use it for fruit juice, cheeses. Look next time you're at the grocery store and see if you see things that are pasteurized. That means that they have been heated to kill the microorganisms that might be contained within and then they're kept in a sterilized environment. Once you open those um, pasteurized items though, they are now free to, for bacteria to get in so they can spoil much quicker once they're opened. So the golden age of microbiology um, was from 1857 to 1914, beginning with Pasteur's work. The discoveries include relationships between microbes and disease, immunity, and antimicrobial drugs. I am going to be posting a few video links that you should watch and take notes on. So infectious diseases, where do they come from? In the past, it was thought that infectious disease came from curses, evil spirits, bad smelling vapors. Um, and now we know that there's a couple different ways to get an infectious disease. One is that it is inherited or passed on through your genetics from your parents. 
Um, another one is that they can be caused by environmental uh, causes like smoking cigarettes, um, or they can be caused by biotic or living agents like bacteria, viruses, fungus, protists, um, and anything that causes a disease is referred to as a pathogen. Pathogens are disease causing agents or sickness makers. So in the 1850 to 2000, we have a table here that shows the life expectancy in years. It used to be that people in the 1850s, they only lived to be about 42 years old. And now in the year 2000 in the UK, they live to an average age of about 77. So life expectancy has increased a lot. In the 1850s, most people died from infectious diseases, viruses, bacterial diseases, and very few people died of things like cancer or circulatory disease. Now in the year 2000, most people die from the percentage of all deaths is well over 50% if you put cancer and circulatory diseases together. Why do you think this is? Why do you think more people now are dying from cancer or circulatory disease, whereas in the 1850s they died from infectious disease? So if we want to know what is making us sick and why it is making us sick, then we have to figure out which organism causes which disease. And that is what the work of Robert Koch did. Robert Koch was a scientist that described the steps of infectious disease in 1876 after the work of many other scientists when he used them to prove that Bacillus anthracis was the cause of anthrax. Bacillus anthracis is a specific bacteria. So what he did was he first isolated the pathogen in an organism from a sick creature. So he took a bunch of organisms that were sick with anthrax and he isolated a bacteria that was present in abundance in those sick organisms that wasn't in the healthy organisms. And he grew them in a culture in a petri dish. This red circle is a petri dish where you can grow bacteria and he got it so it was pure. It was only the Bacillus anthracis. Once he got a pure culture that he grew, he inoculated a healthy organism with it and saw if they got anthrax. And if they did get sick, then he re-isolated that bacteria. He took another sample, swabbed it, and see if he could regrow the same bacteria he grew the first time that he inoculated that organism with. And if he could, then he was able to determine that that was the bacteria that caused that disease. During the past century, Koch's postulates have been used successfully many times. Koch himself discovered the cause of tuberculosis. And Louis Pasteur used Koch's postulates to discover the cause of rabies, anthrax, and chicken cholera. Edward Jenner used it to study smallpox. And Alan Steer um, used it in the 70s in Yale to figure out which bacteria causes Lyme disease. Alan Steer is still living. He still works, I believe, at Harvard, um, and he's still studying the cause and trying to find cures for Lyme disease and Lyme arthritis in particular. So when we look about how disease is spread, there are a couple different ways you can spread disease. The first is person to person. If you cough, sneeze on, or touch somebody and you are sick, then you can give them um, the illness. You can spread it. Things like the common cold, mumps and measles are spread through coughing, sneezing, touch. And to prevent that, you can cover your mouth with a tissue when you cough and make sure that you wash your hands. Another thing when you're coughing, make sure you cough into your shoulder so that you're covering it up. But if you're not coughing in your hands, if you don't have a tissue, then you're not going to spread it on the next person that you touch, you know, cover with your shoulder. Some of the most uh, dangerous pathogens are spread through sexual contact. These are called sexually transmitted diseases or sexually transmitted uh, infections, STDs or STIs. They infect millions and kill thousands each year in the USA alone. Examples of bacterial sexually transmitted diseases are syphilis, which can be fatal, gonorrhea, and chlamydia, which can damage your ability to reproduce. And viruses like hepatitis B and C, genital herpes, and AIDS, which can be fatal. It is very important to 
protect yourself. Third way is contaminated food or water. Prevention for contaminated food or water includes cooking meats properly, hand washing of food workers, and sanitation of water. When you're in the food industry, you're going to learn about some of the most common um, foodborne illnesses, including norovirus, um, salmonella, and you know a bunch of different other organisms that are spread through improperly handled foods. If you do not wash your fruits and vegetables well, if you do not cook your chicken thoroughly um, and contaminate like the raw cooked meat surfaces onto food that's going to be handled, uh, if you do not wash your hands well after the using the va uh, bathroom, that can contaminate your food with fecal matter and cause things like the norovirus. So it is very, very important that people in the food industry or yourself when you're at home make sure that you follow proper safety uh, precautions, cooking things to the proper temperature, washing your hands before handling anything. Do not contaminate raw uh, food with cooked food to help prevent spreading foodborne illness. And infections that are spread by animals are called vector-borne diseases. Animals that carry disease causing organisms from person to person um, are called vectors. An example of this would be ticks or mosquitoes. Um, ticks carry the disease Lyme disease. Um, mosquitoes have carried malaria, West Nile virus, and getting bit by an infected tick or mosquito then can spread the bacterial disease to you or the parasite um, and things that you can do to prevent this is to actually avoid um, avoid getting bit so spraying insecticides avoiding tall grass wearing protective tight clothing if you're going to be in tall grass you can tuck your pants into your socks and pull your socks up over um, your pant legs make sure that you also check yourself for ticks very thoroughly uh, if you do get bit by a tick and you are not sure whether or not it has Lyme disease and you're worried about it, which in Loudoun County, that would be a very founded fear because Lyme disease is very popular uh, or very prevalent in this area, then you can actually take the tick and um, put it into like a little plastic baggie or an old used medicine bottle and take it to your doctor for testing. It is easier to test the tick to see if that tick was harboring Lyme disease than to necessarily find a Lyme infection um, when they're testing your blood. So preventing or fighting infectious disease. Antibiotics are one type of prevention. They are compounds that kill bacteria without harming the cells of human or animals by interfering with the cellular process of the microorganisms. The first discovered antibiotic was penicillium. Now it's known to interfere with the synthesis of the bacterial cell wall. So here are a couple of vocabulary words that you should know. Spontaneous generation, biogenesis, Robert Koch, Louis Pasteur, what is a vector, pathogen, and what is an antibiotic. So make sure that you can describe all of these terms and you feel comfortable with them.